Hi guys, today we're going to read Froggy Plays Soccer. Froggy couldn't sleep. He looked out the window. The full moon was rising. It looked like a soccer ball. Tomorrow's the big game, he said out loud. If we beat the wild things, we win the city cup. In the morning, Froggy was bursting to go. He pulled on his underwear. Zap, tugged on his soccer shorts. Zeep, snapped on his shin guards. Snap, wiggled on his soccer shirt. Zlim, pulled on his soccer socks. Zoop, and put on his cleats. Zip, zip. Froggy, yelled his father. Froggy's father was the assistant coach. What? Let's go, we'll be late for the game. Froggy flopped outside. Flop, flop, flop. Remember, said Froggy's dad, only the goalie can catch the ball and you're not the goalie. Now repeat after me. Head it, boot it, keep knee it, shoot it, but don't use your hands. And Froggy sang, head it, boot it, knee it, shoot it, but don't use your hands all the way to the soccer field. At the field, the coach, Max's mother, said, we're a team, we're the dream team, hooray, screamed the dream team. Soon the game was on. Froggy was doing cartwheels. Froggy was picking daisies. Froggy was picking his nose. The ball bounced off his chest. He gave a mighty kick and missed the ball. But Max trapped it and passed it to BJ who slammed it right into the net. Go! It was one to zero, dream team. Again, the two teams faced off. The whistle blew. The dream team charged down the field toward the wild things. Froggy was tying his shoe. Froggy's dad was yelling, defense, defense. The ball hit Froggy in the head, bonk, and knocked him down. He was, um, great at defense. At halftime, the dream team held the lead. Now remember, said Froggy's dad, and they all chanted together, head it, boot it, knee it, shoot it, but don't use your hands. The whistle blew and the second half started. Fly circled by. Froggy, called the coach. What, answered Froggy. Keep your eye on the flap. The ball smacked Froggy in the eye. Froggy was mad now. The wild things were stampeding and Matthew, the dream team's goalkeeper, was chasing the ball. Now the goal was unguarded. This was Froggy's chance. He leapfrogged over Travis. He leapfrogged over Matthew. He leapfrogged over the wild things forward who was firing the ball. And what a save! Froggy caught it right before the net, but uh oh. What did Froggy use that he is not supposed to use? That's right. Froggy used his hands. Oops, cried Froggy, looking more red in the face than green. He looked so silly, the dream team laughed, but not for long. The penalty for using his hands was a free kick at the goal for the Wild Things. The Wild Things star forward kicked and scored. Now it was a tied game, but it wasn't over yet. 
And when there was one minute left, the crowd went crazy. The clock was ticking. The ball was coming right towards Froggy. Froggy, yelled his dad. What? But Froggy knew what to do. He jammed his hands in his armpits. He stuffed his hands in his pockets. He stuck his hands in his mouth. Then he power kicked the ball so far down the field that it bounced over the goalie's head. Smack into the goal! Yay! The Dream Team won the City Cup. They shouted and danced and Froggy sang, head it, boot it, knee it, shoot it, but don't use your hands except to slap high fives, slap, slap, slap. Okay, so let me grab my um, scripture. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 11 says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. So let's look at a couple of words and phrases here. Let's look at encourage and build up. So when we encourage someone, we build them up. That's a way to build them up. And when we build up things, we make them stronger. We make them better, right? So that says, what that's saying is that we should encourage each other so that we will be built up, so that we'll be stronger and more confident and more assured. And so that we, when we, the opposite of that is to pull people down. So let's take a look at um, what Froggy's mistake was. What was his big mistake? He used his hands. He got excited and he got into the game. And even though he tried really hard to remember by saying his chant over and over, he forgot. And it cost them a goal and it tied up the game. And how did his team react? Well, when Froggy's face turned all red, they thought a frog with a red face looked a little silly and they laughed. Not really laughing at him making fun, but just because they thought something was funny and so they laughed for a minute. But they could have made it worse. They could have pulled Froggy down. And they could have said things like, I wish you were on their team. Or we're gonna lose now and it's all your fault. They could have said things that hurt Froggy and pulled him down. Or they could have said things that encouraged him and built him up. Like, hey, it's okay. Everyone makes mistakes. Hey, we got this. We're a team. We're all in this together. They could have said things that made Froggy feel better. Because the truth is we're all human. We all make mistakes. And we all need somebody to pat us on the back and say, it's okay. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to do better next time. You're growing. You're changing. It's okay. We need people to encourage us. And we need to be encouragers because in the Bible it says to be an encourager. To build people up. His team could have gotten very upset. This is a big game. It's for the City Cup. They could have gotten upset. And they could have said things that later they were sorry for. You know, the truth is that when you make a mistake that's really big, that makes other people upset and angry, and maybe sports is some of the worst of those times. Lord, people can say things in sports that they don't really mean and they regret for sure. And sometimes when you're upset, when you're hurting, when you're angry, that's the time when you have to step it up and you have to be an encourager. You have to remember that it's just a game. It's not as important as a person. And you have to be that encourager. Be that person that builds up your teammates. When you are angry, upset, that's the time that you pull it together and you be that encourager. And when you do that, you show the love of Jesus, not just to that person, but to the whole world. I'll see you next time. Holy Spirit, come and fill this place with your presence. Embolden us to spread the fire of your Spirit. This day, 
May we devote ourselves to teaching and fellowship. May we break bread together. And let us pray as Augustine. Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love but what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. May we never cease to be amazed at your works, and may we always remember that you are with us. Amen. Good morning, Fredonia Church family, and to all those that are joining with us uh, on Facebook. We're so glad you're here this morning as we celebrate 
the coming of the Holy Spirit. This is Pentecost Day, and what a wonderful and beautiful uh, day it is. You know, I must confess that I've been grieving for the last few days uh, since the, uh, uh, the murder in uh, Minnesota, Minneapolis, and, and with all the things that's, that's come out of it, uh, I'm grieving for our nation. You know, I, I think about Jesus and when he came into Jerusalem, the scripture says, now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. You must realize that right now, our nation is being wept over by Jesus, the Son of God. My goodness, how we all should be weeping, how we all should be praying. I want you to know that racism is real. There is problems that we need to change so many things. And I, I, I sense that because we, we, some of us live in a place that we don't see much of it, we don't realize how prevalent racism is. Racism is alive. The division between all races can cause such chaos and the thing, the only thing that can truly help it is an outpouring of the Holy Spirit pouring into each of us that we might uh, do the things that the Holy Spirit gives us power to do, power to love, power to change the world. Today, I want to talk about living in the power of the Holy Spirit living in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be reading two passages. The first one is in John, the gospel according to John, and I'm going to read uh, in, from the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 15. Now this is Jesus himself speaking. He's preparing his disciples for when he leaves. Listen to what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you, listen to this word, forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will leave, I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. A little while longer and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live. He who has my commandments and keeps and keeps them it is he who loves me and he who loves me will love will be loved by my father and i will love him and manifest or reveal myself to him then i'm going to read from second chapter of Acts, kind of to set the stage for what happened that day of Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
The word of God for the people of God. Let's hear it. Praise be to God. Praise be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord, today, teach us more about your Holy Spirit. Illuminate your word in such a way that each of us can understand. Oh, Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on us today. Give us a love that we maybe have not had before. Cause us to love you deeper and more every day. Oh, Father, we thank you for what you've done for us, that you've saved us from ourselves. But, oh, Lord, so many times we turn our back on you. Forgive us when we do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. If you can... And I hope you can remember back uh, when you first come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The first time you truly can say, I know him, I met him, I asked him into my life. Think about that a moment. How wonderful and marvelous that was. I think back on my salvation experience and it was so amazing. And I've heard so many people, and it was this way for me, even as a nine-year-old. I remember thinking all the weight that was on my shoulders was lifted because the Holy Spirit had come, become into me, and I, I knew that I was going to be empowered and someone was going to walk with me through my life. Why is it so often? that it seems like we start out so strong in our Christian walk and, and later we discover that we're facing failure. We're not walking as we once was. Well, I believe there's three primary reasons, and there may be more, but I believe these pretty well cover it. The first primary reason is that we simply drift away from the very principles that we've learned at the beginning of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Those principles that we first learned, we just simply drift away from them. Many believers begin to feel self-confident. And when we feel self-confident, we lose uh, our dependence on Jesus Christ. And oh, my goodness. That's when things begin to fail. That's when we have an, a spiritual setback. Number two, we become so familiar with God's word. Those of us that come to church and gather together and hear his word, uh, sometimes I feel like when I open the Bible and read a scripture, there's, there's somebody out there saying, well, I've heard that a hundred times. He can't teach me nothing about that. And and that's it. You know, there's a reason we pit, preach uh, over and over again the same messages. Because we need to hear the truth over and over. We need God's word to, to bury itself in our hearts as it once did. Now number three, and I this may be the most prevalent. We just simply stop relying on the Holy Spirit. We, uh, uh, we stop allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, to guide us, to give us uh, spiritual power to use, uh, to withstand our temptations, the temptations that come to all of us. And the Holy Spirit also gives us spiritual wisdom that we need to recognize to avoid sin. If we're not able to recognize sin, then we've got, we've got a blind spot. You know, I believe the key to Christian life, uh, the thing that we must understand is we never, ever uh, 
spiritually outgrow our dependency for the Holy Spirit. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's exactly the opposite. The more, the more mature we are in our faith and the more intimate our relationship is with Jesus Christ, the more we truly need to depend on the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, what we have is a dead religion and it's no, it's no good to anyone. And here's the rub. It's always a rub. As Americans, we love our freedom. We love our freedom. And so the Holy Spirit coming to guide us and direct us is totally opposite of, of what, we, uh, what we want in our life. It's an American virtue to have freedom. You know, I think of the the presidents have, that have justified us going to war. It's always uh, something like this. We're going to defend, defend and preserve our freedom. And think of old folks like me and Carol. You know, one of the things I can't even imagine is losing my wife or her losing me but we're getting closer to that time. You know, and I fear that. There's some fear there. But you know what I fear more than anything, and most elderly people do? We fear having to be dependent on someone else. We have been dependent all our lives. The most difficult thing I ever did to my ever did was when my stepfather was in his 90s, we had to take the keys to his car. He wanted his freedom. You know, people decide not to marry because many times they realize or think about it, you know, I'm going to lose my freedom in this. And that's not necessarily true. Actually, uh, marriage is such a good thing. But a lot of times people also uh, divorce because they will tell you simply that they want their freedom. They don't want to be cooped up anymore. We all like our freedom. In America, freedom is the most, most important thing, I, I, probably most important than anything else. And here we have today's gospel that counter, that's countercultural to, to all of that, countercultural to freedom. It is a way that is characterized by obedience and dependence. Completely counteracts our whole culture. Jesus says in our scripture today that if we obey his commands, if we obey his commands, if we love him, then we will obey. He says that. And then immediately he says that he will give us a gift. Talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, which was received on the day of Pentecost. The gift is his presence. The gift is the fact that he will be with us. He will uh, be next to us and in us, and that will enable us to follow him faithfully. You know, when you think about it, in light of this passage, we probably need to consider that the Christian faith is a training ground for obedience and dependency. That's what we're trained to do. And it comes, and it's different than anything else we've been taught. During my time in the Army, I, was, I spent almost a year in an NCO academy as cadre or uh, what you would call training staff. And we trained soldiers to be non-commissioned officers. I remember one particular old crusty sergeant that I admired so much. 
he, when he would tell a group as an introduction, he always told them the same thing. And he, he told them that, you know, let me say this. He was speaking to men because that was the only, uh, men were the only ones in uh, warfare at the time. And, and uh, he said, he said, we're trying to teach you to obey orders so in turn you can teach others to obey orders. You have been spoiled, indulged, taught to think for yourself. And then he'd always say, now that's okay in other jobs, but not in this one. You will be leading men into war, which is risky and life-threatening. And the only way to get those people through the battles is for them to move and to respond quickly to your commands. It's through obedience that lives are saved. The army is training obedience. That's the whole point of our training, he would say. We get you in here in a safe confines of this base and we train you to obey orders so that you, once you get on the battlefield, you will do it without thinking. You see, in the army, I obeyed orders in order to save myself. Jesus wants to save us. Now the difference is, I didn't love that old drill sergeant. I liked him a lot, but I didn't, I didn't love him, so to speak. But we're to love Jesus. And if we love Jesus, he tells us that we will keep his commands. We will obey him. You know, some of us just need to fall back into love with Jesus Christ. Just fall back in love with him. Remember all that he's done for you. Remember the day that you came to him and surrendered your life to him. Remember that and fall back into love with him. See, when we do that, we can truly uh, live in the power of the Holy Spirit. When we've truly surrendered to him and let him have our life and have his will and way in our life. You see, the world is reopening to more chaos than we left with all the rioting and all the things that's going on, folks, listen, there's a lot of folks that have so much hatred and bitterness that we need to go out into the world as Christians and show them the love of Jesus Christ. And we can do that only through the power of the Holy Spirit. See, the world doesn't work that way. We are commanded to witness Jesus' love for us. Now, the world commands us to just keep quiet about our faith and just to go along and get along. But folks, we can no longer do that. The world is being destroyed by hatred and bitterness and anger. And the only way we can counteract that is with love. The only way. You can't counteract it with more hatred and bitterness. Yes, it is a war. It is a war out there and obedience is required. It is Satan versus the Lord. There's a war. It's a battle. There's a battle raging every day. We must have this dog determination to obey Jesus Christ and to walk in his loving way. No matter what nine out of ten people do, we are called to obedience. You know, we are told 
in the name of Jesus, actually by Jesus, that we are commanded to do certain tasks, hard tasks, that are against everything we, we have grown up thinking. We're to confess our sins. We're to love God more than self. We're to forgive our enemies. These are hard things. You see, we're in training here in the safe confines of our homes. You're sitting here listening to me from your home where it's safe. And we're being trained to obey orders so that when we get out on the battlefield of life, obedience to the narrow way of Christ will be second nature for us. And here, here's the greatest promise ever. When, when you go out, when you and I go out into the battlefield of life, you are no longer alone. You are not alone. You're not alone now in your home. You're not alone. Even if you may be physically alone, the Holy Spirit is with you. When you are reminded of your sinful uh, limitations or reminded that, that forgiving uh, those that persecute you must be done or it's an impossible text for a person like you or me. We must remember that Jesus Christ did not leave us alone. He gave us the power to overcome. He gave us the power to forgive. He gave us the power to love others. He doesn't expect us to be faithful on our own. He sends you and I out with the Holy Spirit. He sends us out knowing that, that the constant near presence of God to strengthen us will enable us, enable us and empower us to do things we could never, ever do on our own. You know, I want to I tell you just a little bit in closing about the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I leave, I will send you a helper. Some versions say counselor or advocate. The word is parakletos, the Greek word, and it means the one who walks beside you. And folks, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit guides us into the right path and convicts us of sin. I don't like that part always, but he always convicts us when we stray from the path. The Holy Spirit teaches us the truth of God's Word and teaches us how to apply God's Word to our daily lives. The Holy Spirit conforms us to the very image of Jesus Christ and His works through us, and He works through us to minister the presence and power of Christ to others. That's what he calls us to do. He calls us to do more than just live our lives in a shell. The Holy Spirit is proof that we belong to him. If you have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, first of all, you know it. I hear people say, well, I'm not sure. Well, if you're not sure, you don't have it. I want to ask two or three, probably three questions. The first question as I close is simply this. Are you indwelled with the Holy Spirit? And number two, are you living in that power? Galatians 22, I don't remember the verse, Galatians 5, verse 22, I do remember the verse. Galatians tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Folks, listen, if we go out with that into the world, we can win the battles of life. But if we go out carnal, without the Holy Spirit, if we go out and, and 
and live our lives according to our own natures. See, the acts of sinful nature are pretty obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, which is lustful pleasures, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, now it's getting serious, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, facts, factions, and envy, drunkenness, and orgies. Wouldn't it be amazing, wouldn't it be wonderful if the whole church world went out filled with the Holy Spirit? What if just our church at Fredonia was fully filled with the Holy Spirit? If the fruit of the Spirit shone in every one of our lives, what a difference could we make? Just think about it. And what if that was multiplied by all the churches around us and all over the nation? What if that was expressed, not just in the church, but when we go out? I want you to search your heart this morning. Are you truly living in the power of the Holy Spirit? If you're not, then you need to rededicate your life. You need to talk to Jesus about what has been going on in your life. You may need to talk to a minister or a teacher. Please feel free to talk to me. You may, you may say, well, this, none of this applies to me. I've never accepted Christ as my Savior. I don't know nothing about this Holy Spirit you're speaking of. If you'll come humbly and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and the third day was, was risen from the grave and that you are a sinner, that you need a Savior and you respond to Jesus as your Savior, the Holy Spirit will fill you this day. Let us pray. Almighty God, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for everything uh, that you're doing for us, but we pray for this nation right now. We ask you, God, to fill this nation with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may go out and live a life according to your will that other folks will see. The things that we've seen this week are not a few. And Father, I understand all of it and the reasons for it, but Father, we need you to touch the hearts and minds of all those that are divisive in trying to uh, cause uh, chaos and, disruption, and disruption in our world. Bring us peace as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. I think I got to do a Facebook poll. Goodbye.